Around the dawn of the century, the New York press became aware of a new business which was doing rather well. In fact, it was turning over to the tune of millions of dollars a year annually, and it was called the song manufacturing business. It was run by a bunch of go-ahead fellows, sort of artist businessmen, who were keenly aware of a vast new audience, what came to be called the urban masses. Freed from the Victorian ethic of all work and no play, these new masses had lots of leisure time, and they wanted plenty of entertainment. In particular, they seemed to need instant off-the-peg songs. Songs that could be sung in the fast-rising vaudeville theatres or danced to at balls, or simply bought a sheet music and played on the old parlour piano to friends and family. So, this new breed of song salesmen settled down in New York, which was the nerve center of show business, and turned out such ready-made songs for mass consumption. The press, as I said, intrigued by this trade, sent out one Munro Rosenfeld of the New York Herald to interview one of these new song salesmen, a fellow called Harry Von Tiltsa. And Tilsa, at the time of this interview, was trying to come up with some song hits from the piano in his New York office. The day was hot, the windows were wide open, and the sounds of his pals and rivals bashing away at their respective pianos was absolutely ear-piercing. Hurry, pleaded Rosenfeld. I gotta get a title for the series I'm doing about our song business. Now rack the brains, old sport, and try and think of something. Rosie, said Harry. Rosie, put your head out of the window and grab an earful of the sounds of nature, the sounds of my friends and rivals. You know, it's always reminded me of a kitchen clatter, like tin pans. So, why not call your series Tin Pan Alley? Well, the phrase caught on and came to mean that area in New York where the hits were made night and day. <laughs> The men of Tin Pan Alley, the Alley Men, became highly skilled at turning out all kinds of songs for all kinds of moods and occasions. I suppose they were really like folk artists, and like the folk, they weren't squeamish about where their songs and their tunes came from. For instance, they might take something, a line from something as well known as the Alleluia Chorus. grab something from a folk song, like, for instance, uh, Oh, bring back my body to me, so you get. And then they'd come out with something like, Yes, we have no bananas. We have no bananas today. We brought beans like bunions, kabaji's and onions and all kinds of fruit and say we got a nice juicy tomato nice crunchy potato but yes we have no bananas oh no bananas we have no bananas today thank you the first big hits of the alley tended to be songs of romance, ballads which tugged at the heart. For instance, Harry von Tiltsa, the man who coined the phrase Tin Pan Alley, was having great success at the time with one of his ballads. It was a, a tearjerker, a story of purchased love, the kind of song young ladies of the time lapped up. He first tried out this song in his um, <clears throat> friendly local brothel, and when he was finished, the ladies of pleasure he saw were all in floods of tears, and he knew right there and then he had a real smash hit. The ballroom was filled with fashion's flower. It shone with a thousand lights. And there was a woman who passed along, the fairest of all the sights. A girl to her lover then softly sighed, there's riches at her command. But she married for wealth, 
Not for love, he cried, though she lives in a mansion grand. She's only a bird in a gilded cage, a beautiful sight to see. You may think she's happy and free from care, She's not, though she seems to be. Tis sad when you think of her wasted life, for youth cannot mate with age. And her beauty was sold for an old man's gold. She's a bird in a gilded cage. Well, those alley men. You see, when they discovered that sentiment would sell, the ballad became the backbone of the business. These new song products not only spread throughout the United States, but spilled over the ocean into Europe. But then Europe had her own ballads. After all, she had invented them. But what she didn't have was this new pop sound that was brewing in America. It was nonstop syncopation. It was ragtime. Ragtime, hot and steaming from the brothels of the South and the Midwest, surfaced into the mainstream of American pop. It was the first Afro-American music, and musicologists questioned its worth, clerics denounced it, and the American Federation of Musicians went so far as to outlaw it. You see, in these new songs, the these and thous of Victorian balladry had suddenly become the anchors and the wonchers and the honey babes. But by the 1910s, the alley men had tamed the original wild ragtime and turned it into music of their own time. They wrote of Dixie and Swanee and Carolina and Alabama without ever going there. And yet, they made these places seem so full of magic 